<laughs> Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Maciej Grochowski. I was working for a couple last couple of months on fuzzing NetBSD kernel. Uh, however, this knowledge also applies to fuzzing other kernels. Uh, it shouldn't be hard to get this working also on FreeBSD. I was also doing some work to get this on FreeBSD, so you can also apply this uh, to fuzz your FreeBSD kernel. Uh, so the outline of the presentation, uh, first of all, what we are trying to achieve. And this talk also assume that you don't have a lot of knowledge about the fuzzing and breaking the kernel. So this will give you a pretty good overview what you can do, what techniques are available, and some background knowledge, like how this thing works under the hood. Uh, so we'll talk about the coverage as a kind of feedback uh, for our fuzzer that is used for the fuzzing. Uh, I will also mention a little bit sanitizers, uh, but I won't go uh, too deeply to sanitizers because this is also a very wide topic. Uh, however, yesterday was a very good talk about sanitizers on LL uh, VM dev room, so if you miss it, it and you want to learn more, you can also uh, see the recording. Uh, we'll also show how to do the basic uh, setup for the fuzzer, and as a demo, we'll try to run fuzzing on the uh, FFS uh, on NetBSD kernel uh, as a virtual machine. So hopefully, we may find something interesting. Uh, sure. Uh, okay, so. And first thing uh, to justify why are we why are we trying to break things or uh, why why I'm doing this is essentially a need for having multiple different uh, ways uh, to improve the quality of software. And as we all know, kernel is a very critical part of the operating system. If you break the kernel, uh, you have serious issue. And there is no known uh, silver bullet to solve all the issue and ensure software quality. So usually what people do is multiple parallel actions to improve code quality and software quality in general. Because we know we always will have some bugs or some issues. But from the other side, we would like to have reasonable quality software and something that won't break very easily. Uh, so we can have some list of things that we can do to improve our software, starting from stuff like getting code reviews, applying best practices, and so on and so forth. Uh, this list is far from being complete, and probably it can be a couple of other slides to just list different techniques that we know. But I think one of the most important and most interesting, or some other people may say boring things, is about testing the software. Uh, so for me, testing is like the um, time when software uh, meets the truth. So if you just do the reviews, if you are just doing uh, analysis of your code without uh, testing, without running the software, of course, it's not good. Uh, from the other side, technique is also very wide area. There's a lot of resources how people do testing. Uh, but I think in our context, it's fair to say that fuzzing is also a kind of testing for our software. Uh, so first of all, uh, what the fuzzing is. Uh, usually we call fuzzing when we have uh, some way to test the software which, in, which expects some input. And as a, um, as, a, as a testing technique, we are trying to give our program some strange unexpected input and we are observing what is the behavior uh, for this particular input. So the simplest fuzzer that can be written is just, for example, let's say we have some binary that you like to fuzz, which is called uh, fuzz binary, and this binary gets us an input 1000 kilobytes uh, and some raw byte input. And so what we can do we can just write some very dummy fuzzer in a couple of bash lines, or even in one, if you like, very long sentences, and just get some random input, save it somewhere, or pipe it to the binary, and then run binary. And the funny thing is, if 
the, if the program is not written having validation in mind, in that way you always you all you already can break some programs, which is very funny. Uh, but the good thing uh, would be to think how we can improve our dummy fuzzer. So what we can what we can do uh, to get the fuzzing smarter. And one thing that came usually to head is how we can generate the input in more uh, intelligent way, more smarter way. So one of the technique is mutation-based fuzzing. Uh, so mutation-based essentially uh, assume that we can come up with some strategies that will be smarter or have some logical sequence uh, instead of just getting the random bits. And we can, based on those strategies, we can mutate the input and provide this input to the application. Uh, by definition, mutation-based fuzzing doesn't really care about the state of application because uh, we are just caring about strategy. So we have some strategy to flip certain bits or uh, the strategy can also be aware about the grammatics. So for example, if you are fuzzing the uh, HTTP uh, request, you can get some payload, which is like uh, in order of HTML standard and then play with different tags. Uh, you don't have to have just raw bytes that you are modifying. Uh, so in that way, we are able to much easier find some interesting inputs uh, than in just a random way. And also, if you get a random input, usually if you, your program expects some different tags, some different header in the input format, you're usually just stopping on some first couple of checks that are making sure that your uh, input is, is have some, for example, certain um, uh, header, certain um, pattern at the very beginning. Uh, another way to improve the fuzzer is introducing the feedback loop. So in the feedback loop, we essentially get some um, feedback from running application about application state. And this state can be measured in different ways. The most popular one is the coverage, code coverage. Uh, but we also can think about other things like uh, timing, uh, CPU resources, and stuff like how application behave with uh, how application behave with the environment. And so, funny thing, when I was doing those slides, I just put timing because, first of all, uh, timing is known from uh, cryptographic software. So, for example, if you have some cryptographic software which uh, have different timing for different requests based on the execution path, you obviously have security issue. Uh, but I was thinking, yes, yeah, so that's a good example, but from the other side, I didn't saw many like um, timing-based fuzzers. And yesterday when I was waiting for my uh, Fosden t-shirt, I met my colleague, he's working for Tor project, and we started talking, and I told him, oh yeah, I'm doing the talk on BSD dev room uh, about the fuzzing. And he was like, oh really, I have a friend actually was doing a fuzzing based on mutation and he used a timing for execution of this uh, program to the firmware and based on this execution time he was doing modification to the software and by this way he was able to break some popular electronic device main uh, electronic device so i was like oh really so that means this this really works uh, so yeah i will also try to depart in this timing uh, timing way to uh, this way to measure uh, the feedback from the application uh, so it was pretty funny uh, also from the testing court we have stuff like uh, we can think about our fuzzing based on uh, the application that we fast so if for example as in similar way as we are doing testing so we have white box testing black box testing if we don't have for example uh, all information but we have some information we can also say we have gray uh, box testing and uh, so this feedback loop also uh, depends what kind of fuzzing are you doing in our example we will be doing uh, white box testing because obviously we have a kernel that you can compile we can instrument the code and then we can monitor the state of the application based on uh, those informations uh, so coverage tracking as i said that's one of the main technique how you can get the feedback uh, from the application and that is how many fuzzers works. Um, main coverage trace is PC trace, program counter. It tells us about the execution path. 
and the good thing uh, how we can start under our uh, our understanding of this format is essentially the way how it's stored in our program. Uh, so whenever we run the program or whenever we have a kernel, because kernel is also a kind of program, uh, we need some array, we need some memory location where we will be putting the sequence of PC counters. So in our example, we have uh, array of size 100 uh, with 100 entries, but it can be much wider. And when the program is executing, this can be done, for example, per thread, per process, or if you are running the kernel, it can be uh, also something per kernel thread, but also you can think about some global uh, array. For example, if you don't care about the threads, but you care about the uh, execution path, because what can happen if you are fuzzing the networking, you can put the request to the networking queue, and then another thread will be getting this request uh, from the queue. So if you are fuzzing based on the thread, then you will be just seeing the path when you put the packet to the queue, instead of seeing the another thread, which can be different, that will be processing your request. Um, so how this ex exactly works? As I said, those are compile, compile time uh, instrumentations, uh, so they are put by compiler. Uh, so on the right, we have a program, very simple, which have main, which call bar, uh, which call foo, which call bar. Uh, so what will happen during the compilation phase? Uh, our compiler will put some magic instrumentation at the very beginning of all functions. And those will execute when we are executing the program and won't interact with our program. Uh, but what are those magic instrumentation? Uh, so I get a code listing from NetBSD kernel. And it's a little bit modified just to give you some brief idea what is going on. Uh, so every time when we hit the instrumentation, uh, we call this function instrument code. And this function uh, need to get our uh, our, our uh, memory that we reserve for presenting the uh, PC counters, and uh, we obviously we get the index because we need to write another entry. Uh, we also need to do stuff like border checking because uh, based on also uh, your intention, you sometimes may overflow, and if you do, the question is for you what you would like to do. But uh, the most important part we are just getting the. Uh, PC from the function from which we were called uh, by just compiler macro. So if you run our very simple program, I uh, will end up with array of three entries, main, full, bar. So it's very straightforward. And we don't have uh, only PC trays. We have also a couple other different trays. We have CMP, diff, and GP, what they are. Uh, CMP trays uh, is used for uh, for application, or is used to instrument the uh, comparison instructions. Uh, div is for uh, every time when you're doing division between the arguments. GEP is for manipulating indexes of the arrays. So compiler have some understanding about those, and when it compiles the code, it will put the instrumentation before every instruction is performed. So then you can have better understanding. Why you need to have different we well, have uh, different types. And uh, so you can imagine, like, based on your program, uh, you may be doing some uh, mathematical operations, like you can uh, compare the argument. You have some graph or some tree that you are traversing. Uh, so only the PC counter doesn't give you full information because you may always see the same path. However, the path is not the same because you are just, you know, getting different arguments. Uh, or if you are manipulating a lot of uh, indexes of array, you may also see the same function called over and over again, but from the other side, you use different arguments. Uh, so I here present the CMP trace. Uh, it's a little bit different than PC trace, uh, but from the other side, it's something that also you have in all BSD kernels, as far as I know, and also other ones are similar in terms of format. Uh, so instead of just one or just one information, you have arguments of uh, of the operation. So we have uh, the numbers that we are comparing. Uh, the types tells you uh, about the size of the arguments. So if it's eight bit, uh, are 16, 32, 64, so on. And also you have PC trace. Uh, so you have a set sequence of those sets of four um, values inside the, your array. 
And as I said, everything depends on your kernel, on your code that you're fuzzing. So it uh, depends which part, for example, of the kernel are you trying to fuzz. It's always good to think, okay, so if the PC trace is the only one that I would like to uh, see in my fuzzer. Uh, other important tools, sanitizers, as I said, I won't be going how they actually works, uh, but I'm trying to convince you that they are very useful. And the reason why they are very useful is when you meet any issue in your code, uh, the code may not exit after invalid operations perform. For example, you can have memory corruption, but this memory corruption won't expose easily. Uh, so in that case, you can run the fuzzer and then don't have any crash even if you corrupted some data. Uh, so if you get the uh, sanitizers, uh, here we have three kernel sanitizers, other sanitizers, a leak sanitizer and memory sanitizer. They are available uh, in NetBSD. You can also have undefined behavior sanitizer. There's thread sanitizer. I didn't know too much about thread sanitizers at the moment, but I am also looking uh, about them. Uh, so the very simple one to start with is Kassan because uh, it detects things like out of bound for chip stack uh, and other like a common mistakes from the software. Uh, the downside is you cannot have all at once because some of them are mutually exclusive with other ones. Uh, so for example, you cannot, by definition, you cannot have uh, ASAN and MSAN, other sanitizer and memory sanitizer because they are relying on the same data. So they are overlapping each other. So in LLVM it's specified that you cannot use both. And from the other side, they also provide some uh, slowdown because they are compiled times and they also introduce another instructions. Uh, but as, as I said, uh, they allow you to fast bugs easier and faster. So I think uh, it's very, uh, very uh, it's big leverage for the fuzzer to actually run your uh, fuzzer uh, with address sanitizer or any other sanitizer. Depends on also what kind of bugs are you expecting. Uh, let's go to the fuzzer. Uh, the one that I was using for a couple of months uh, is American Fuzzy Loop. I think everyone know American Fuzzy Loop is very popular. It has very good record for found bugs. Uh, some people also claim it's pretty old at this moment. Uh, but I think like as a starting point, it's very good because first of all, it's very easy to use. It's rock solid. Uh, but from the other side, it didn't uh, have a goal to fuzz the kernels, but just the user space, like, uh, but just the user space program. So uh, you cannot use it directly uh, to fuzz your kernel. You need some modification. Um, so what that modifications are? Uh, we can think first of all what we have from the kernel side, what we have from uh, AFL side, uh, what format AFL require. Uh, so Unix has Linux, FreeBSD, NetBSD, OpenBSD, and other uh, expose the coverage using coverage device slash dev slash kcov. Uh, using this device, you can get, for example, PC trace, CMP trace. Uh, the way how you access this data, you uh, configure the device using IOCTOS, and then you, dem you do the memory map. Uh, then you run your program. And after we finish, your memory, your map memory, uh, should contain uh, those arrays that I discussed previously. From the other side, AFL uses its own specific format, where uh, AFL focuses on par pairs of the uh, PC counters. So, and um, it stores a unique, um, it stores unique PC counter pairs, which means every time when we perform another. Uh, when we perform another instrumentation, which means we have another PC, we remember the old PC counter or zero if we just started, and then get the old PC counter and uh, current PC counter, XOR them together very easily, uh, make sure that we don't overflow, and then increase one in our map, which gives a compiler, uh, uh, which gives a fuzzer hint. This pair of those two PC counter um, just happened. Uh, so then, then the fuzzer can s analyze this array and say, OK, so I got another pair that I didn't saw before. Or maybe I always get the same pairs of PC counters, which means I need to do something different. 
Uh, so it's very easy to convert PC trace to AFL trace uh, because they look the same. Uh, but from the other side, we don't even have to do that. Uh, we can just store, because it's just uh, storing redundant data, we can just do this on fly. Uh, so we can store two values and this map. Uh, and this is everything that uh, our AFL needs to work. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we did some work and modify a little bit uh, NetBSD cake-off. And uh, essentially, we allow uh, you to plug in another kernel module, which will hook to the coverage functions that are already there. Uh, by doing that, you don't have to manage the default resources, but you still can use them if you like. Uh, but from the other side, you can do things like, as I show, like uh, converting one input from uh, coverage to another one. You can think about any other type of um, any other type of fuzzer that you can use, and uh, you don't have to copy all cake of code and then manage file descriptors, make sure that threads are open, closed, all of those things that you need to copy from cake of. You can just focus on uh, coverage functions and mmap. That's what you really need, and then you can uh, leverage on what is written already. Uh, okay, so how this looks. Uh, first of all, when I think about the fuzzing, I first of all think what uh, is the input, what is the output. Uh, so here we have my setup for um, uh, for fuzzing the FFS mount. So my input is my uh, file image. My output will be the result of uh, mount or kernel slash, and and. This uh, and this sequence uh, also require a couple other things like a wrapper. Um, as I said earlier, there's like a plugin for uh, for Kcov, and it works like uh, we have a fuzzer. The fuzzer create the file system image. We need our wrapper that will prepare the file system image to be mounted, but also will execute the code that we need. So it will be executing the mount. Also, we do not uh, we do not trace the wrapper. Uh, this is just a thing that helps us to trigger the execution path in the kernel. And uh, then we do the mount. Uh, mount is calling syscall, VFS, uh, file system layer. On all of those layers, we call, we get the coverage uh, data. This coverage data then is transformed by our AFL uh, plugin. This plugin is exposed to the fuzzer as this map of the pairs that I showed before. And then after every run, uh, the fuzzer will get the input, uh, run the input, will get the output from the shared memory. We'll see, okay, so what different strategy as our feedback uh, we should change or did we found any interesting things? And after the feedback phase, it's just perform another operation over and over again um, until we've hit something interesting. Um, so, what, so I would like also to talk a little bit more about uh, the wrapper itself because also it's interesting. Uh, so the way how you usually write those wrappers is I write them in shell. I focus, okay, so what kind of operation I'm doing. And then after I'm done with shelling, I need to translate to some other better performing language. I, I usually just use C, but you can use C++ or anything else that can expose your uh, interfaces like uh, system calls uh, because you don't want to run on top of library, someone else's libraries. You just want to have the, simple, the simplest, maybe not even the simplest, but uh, the shortest code that you can do. Uh, and this is also well documented on every fuzzer that uh, the performance is very key, even if your father is very smart and doing very good guesses about different inputs and then analyzing the output very well, it still can perform much worse than much simpler father, which is just faster, because uh, in order to find some bugs, you'll need to run this uh, 10,000 times, million times iteration, maybe even billion times if iteration if you have some very well-tested software. Uh, so in that in that regard, you need something that is performing operation very quickly. Uh, so remember, performance is the key. Use raw interfaces. Uh, 
other things also that are useful uh, when we are doing the uh, when we are doing the fuzzing is how I can see what is going on inside my fuzzer, and for example, what the problem that I had was um, when I ran my first fuzzer and it was the first fuzzer I saw like it's very it's not very slow but from the other side it's very ineffective. So I was thinking, okay, so what's going on inside this fuzzer? How I can debug that? So then what I did, I ran the KCOF on my uh, fuzzing wrapper and I monitor what kind of execution path is inside so by the fuzzer. And I realized, for example, in NetBSD, uh, we have much more verbose kernel and we got a lot of operations from uh, virtual memory. Even if you are doing mount, you see more uh, virtual memory operations, which mean you are actually not fuzzing the mount, you are fuzzing stuff related to the management of the pages. Uh, so this is also this is also a bit tricky. And for example, in this way, in this way, you can get the input. You can understand uh, what is actually going on under the hood. Uh, other thing that you can also do before you start, or uh, if you would like to tune something, it's also doing uh, coverage benchmark. A uh, fuzzer benchmark. So you can see, for example, if you want to understand if your wrapper is f fast or slow, you can, for example, put some very dummy code inside the kernel. Uh, what I've done was create some simple uh, cover, uh, some simple character device. We just get some s input, uh, com like compare this with the pattern, and then if the pattern match you won the lottery, so you kernel crash. If it doesn't, you just run over and over again. Uh, but then I can see how well my, uh, because this code is very simple, I can see how well my operation in my uh, wrapper perform. And from the other side also, you can compare this, uh, this kind of check with user space, which also gives you some intuition uh, how well are you doing. Uh, so to do the local to do the local setup of the fuzzer, uh, we also need to have some initial corpus. Uh, so this initial corpus, uh, you can create the corpus from, for example, just raw zeros. As it's very well documented that uh, the AFL is able to reproduce some uh, different formats. So for example, if you are fuzzing the a JPEG or some other images, uh, AFL is able to reproduce those images. But from the other side, if you are running a little bit slower because you are in the kernel space, and also you don't want to spend like a initial CPU cycle just to figure out what is the header or what is the magic number for the file system inside the, inside the image, you can just create one and provide this as a raw uh, initial as a raw initial uh, data for the fuzzer, so this also very helps with speeding up the fuzzing. And once we have that, uh, we can run our fuzzer uh, with option K, which was added um, in uh, it was added in AFL by uh, guys from Oracle when they also were doing the fuzzing of uh, file systems. Uh, so essentially, I reuse. Uh, they work and integrated this with NetBSD and FreeBSD uh, to make them work for both. And then you also need to specify the wrapper. So the important thing is, in that case, you're running on the same, you're running on the same, you're fuzzing the same binary that you're running on. So do not shoot uh, into yourself in food because if your kernel crash, uh, then your data may disappear. You may even not see. Uh, the latest output in the AFL. Uh, so you need to make sure that you know what you are doing. So if, for example, you are fuzzing something what is unstable and you will be finding a lot of bugs, maybe it's good to get uh, this input and output somewhere outside of your kernel so you can mount this on NFS, for example. It will be slower, but from the other side, uh, you will have less issues and then run this process remotely uh, because if you don't, then every time when you crash, you can lose the data that you are looking for. Uh, but from the other side, if you have well-tested software and uh, you just will be happy if you will find a couple of bugs or maybe one bug even, you can just run this natively on your kernel 
uh, what I've done, for example, was connecting the debugger to the kernel, run AFL. If anything crash, I can just get output from debugger and see what's going on. I can also get crash somewhere. Uh, sometimes I realize that depends on the path that you crash, you still may not get the, uh, you still may have some problems uh, with getting the output. Uh, so because the ideal scenario is you get the output, uh, which is the latest image that you were fuzzing, and then you can get this image and check, okay, so if this image always break my kernel of this was something that was from some before testing. So usually uh, it's very nice if you have output that is a payload that you can just mount and then it every and break your kernel. Okay, uh, so how many iterations to find a bug in fuzzing FFS? Uh, so we'll, what we'll be doing, we'll just run on the same virtual machine, the fuzzer and that's actually some other issue that I found at the very beginning, uh, but hopefully we can we can find something interesting. Uh, okay. Okay. So uh, I need to get. Um, I don't know how big it can be because then the father need to also. Okay. Uh, so we have here the father. It's modified version. We have inside in um, a file, which is our pre pre prepare. It's not zero, um, so the name is a little bit misleading. Uh, but we can see that oh, this is zero. OK. Uh, I was fuzzing this. Okay, anyway. Um, so actually, this is zero. So I was fuzzing this before, and I think. Yes. Uh, well, thanks. Okay. So it's not zero. Uh, uh, so we can see this is the legit uh, file system image. So we have the out offset, which is uh, eight, I think, eight k, mm -hmm. and we have some mm, uh, some magic mm, from the headers of FFS. I won't go too much in deeper details, but we see the structure is. It's not. It's not just a zero file. Um, so the way how we run it, mm, we can have this. Okay. So I won't run this yet because I usually also get uh, wrapper as an absolute path. Wrapper. Mount. Uh, so we run AFL fast minus K, uh, I from input, O from output. Uh, I didn't remember exactly, but I think this definitely will work if we will get the, um, the wrapper itself. Okay, uh, from the other side, this running on GDB. So we have connected debugger because this is just a virtual machine and uh, this is debugger that is debugging the kernel, so we can stop in every time. We can see the trace, we can continue the trace. Uh, we can also see that because we stopped, virtual machine just froze. And just continue. Uh, so then our virtual machine is still living. Okay, let's, let's run this thing. Oh, we already got something. So this run the dry, uh, so this this run the, so it was running the dry input at the dry run at the very beginning. So at dry run, it's just do some simple modification. And what we can see here uh, is, yeah, usually it also should show you the AFL console, but because we hit something probably because I was uh, testing this before, so we have some old history. So it was also running something that was found before. Uh, but we can go here, and this is already running in getting the core dump from the kernel. Mm, okay, but we have uh, op operations that uh, crash. So we have VFS reclaim. 
uh, which uh, was called uh, on, op on the, on the Vino that was reclaimed from the Vcash. Uh, so that's kind of a moment when you start debugging the kernel. And I won't right now be doing this uh, because <laughs> it requires some time and also uh, I'm not in the right now great position as a presenter to start debugging that. Uh, but this is some. Uh, this is something that uh, it break, broke our kernel, uh, so this might be related to the to the data from the V nodes, and this uh, we can get this as a core, or we can start debugging this. Um, we can start debugging this in GDB. Okay, uh, I think we can just go to some. Okay. Uh, okay, so conclusion. Uh, so, fuzzing, so fuzzing the kernel is another way, as, as I said earlier, we need a lot of different ways to test our kernel um, that we can, just, we can just do to make sure that our quality of our drivers, our file systems is better. Also, if you like to you know, start searching for some bugs, this is also a very uh, easy way to start. And we have recently a lot of good work for improving things that allows us to run the fuzzing. So for example, uh, gathering the coverage in NetBSD and other BSD in general improved. Also sanitizers uh, in particular in NetBSD become much better over the time. Uh, it's very easy to start, as you see. It doesn't require much knowledge. So I think in this half hour, I s gives you almost everything that you need to start your adventure with the fuzzing and also you should run uh, the sanitizers uh, by the way this was not run on sanitizer because we didn't have any sanitizer output uh, so future work uh, i would like to have some also discussion with other uh, people i saw uh, andrew presentation from freebsd that he's also doing something on afl so maybe we can came with some similar way that we fuzz bsds um, I saw previously on Linux, uh, they introduced another device. It was slash div slash AFL, which community didn't like it. And it was not upstream at the end. Uh, so I think if we will try to get this on common interface, that will be beneficial for everyone, because then people from security projects can just, you know, fast our kernel in the same way. Uh, I also need to spend more time on improving the remote fuzzing because it didn't scale very well if you want to find many bugs and just continue with uh, fuzzing and fixing the bugs. Uh, the resources, so our NetBSD blog, there's also paper, uh, Oracle paper, yes, from 2016. Uh, my collection of mount wrapper, Clank documentation also is a very useful source of information. And I will be happy to get any questions, if any. Any questions? Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. one group just because <laughs> we can listen to the questions and the I answers. Would like, I would like to thank you for your talk. I would like to ask you about is it possible to use RPL and a kind of for remote fighting? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the question was, can you use AFL for remote fuzzing, not for the fuzzing that was presented? Uh, the answer is yes, but you need to do additional setup because, as I said, uh, AFL use the same data on uh, use input and output directories, so you need to mount to have them remotely. You need to run this as a pro you need to run this as a process, and then you need also some way uh, to send back the uh, send back the information to the fork server that crash happened because your process just stopped. And the thing that I'm currently looking on is how to get efficiently the kernel dump because then you have the dumping process so this allocation for dump also need to be mounted for something like nfs again or some other protocol i mean nfs is the simplest one uh, but you can potentially come with some other good ideas and uh, i don't know 
how hard it will be to get AFL console to realize to analyze those crashes to say uh, because when you're fuzzing the user space uh, user space library or user space binary you see those unique crashes for example so AFL is going for the core dump of the process and then saying okay so this one occur before so then it's not unique it's like something similar or this one is not unique because it's something different and then AFL also takes strategies from those crashes uh, to improve uh, so that's so I think as I said that part about analyzing the uh, core dump from uh, kernel is some unknown for me other things can be done easily mm -hmm. go ahead <laughs> okay maybe someone wants to leave the room before the second question? Okay.